Could Utah be an under the radar team to make the next move in realignment? You are locked on college football, your daily podcast on all things college football, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. Realignment, the coaching carousel, the portal, all that and more. We've got you covered. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential liar can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Terms and condition conditions do apply. JT Wistersill of Locked On Utes joining me here to discuss a rather important clause for those of us who dive deep into the realignment landscape, as we do regularly here on the show. We see the numbers and know that it is a hot topic because it's the biggest topic. Nothing impacts a team's football future more than who you're playing against, what conference you're in, how much money you're getting, and such. Utah, unlike Colorado, did not have to sign a 99-year grant of rights with the Big 12, which keeps it ironclad so the Colorado can't go elsewhere. But Utah was not exactly at the forefront of wanting to be in the Big 12 in the first place. They made that very clear. They were forced to go once Oregon and Washington departed the Pac-12 for the Big 10, and they left with the Arizona schools to join. But Arizona, I don't think really cared. Arizona State didn't want to go to the Big 12. They're, of course, there now. And Utah also was not exactly open to going to the Big 12. So when you factor in that clause, JT, and look at what's going on over in the ACC, are those conversations that can be had? I think they definitely are. And I think you're absolutely right when you mentioned Utah's position of wanting to stay in the Pac-12 at the time. I think that they thought that was their best opportunity for success being set up with just getting into the college football playoff and all of those things like that. And they're still set up for an opportunity to do that now in the big 12, but you know, there was still a path to success. They thought in the PAC 12. And as you highlighted, when it became apparently clear that there was not, then Utah makes their way over to the big 12. And I think as of right now, Utah's happy to be in the big 12 as well. I am excited for the possibility of Utah's future in the big 12, but let's also not act like the big 12 is the Pac-12, or not the Pac-12, excuse me, but the SEC and the Big Ten. So if there was an opportunity that ever arose that would allow Utah to make their way over to one of the two power conferences, I think they'd absolutely do everything in their power to do so, just like every single college not in those two would absolutely love to do. So I think Utah, if they could make it happen, they absolutely would eventually. They did a good job getting in the Big 12. They were basically the last one to get on. You mentioned Arizona State. Like Once Arizona went, we kind of knew they were going to as well, and Utah was kind of the final one. I mean, literally two weeks earlier, Mark Harlan was on stage with Commissioner Kalayakov at the Pac-12 Media Day talking about how strong this conference was, and then two weeks had passed, and now he had to go over and join the Big 12. Utah is set up for success there. They can continue to build their brand. And I think eventually they want to put themselves in positions for something Kyle Whittingham has sell, himself has even talked about, super conferences. When they arrive, Utah is in a position to potentially be a part of one. Yeah, and when Utah went into the Big 12, in my view and in the view of the betting market, they immediately became the favorite in that conference. And, and look, if you're talking academically and culturally, Utah is not a one-to-one -one fit with a lot of the schools in the Big 12. To me, Utah feels more definitely Pac-12, but ACC or Big 10. And the Big 10 is certainly the one of the Power 2 conferences that I think would make the, more, the most sense. Because thus far, in all of these conversations and all these realignment moves that we have seen take place, JT, the SEC actually hasn't expanded its footprint. Right, They have been, as Washington State President Kirk Schultz described, a predatory or opportunistic member is what Paul Feinbaum phrased it as, however you want to see it. But they added Texas and Oklahoma. They were already in Texas. They had Texas A&M. What's Texas next to? Louisiana. Oh, that's right. LSU is there. And then you just keep working your way along the South. They've barely expanded. The Big Ten is the league that now goes from Rutgers to Los Angeles that I think could be in a position to add a Florida State and a Clemson or Miami if they decide that they, number one, can get out of the ACC, number two, want to and are willing to pony up the money. I think if that move takes place, that makes Utah look at the Big Ten as, 
well, that's kind of where we'd like to be because I don't think as a university, they would join the Big 12 and make sure that they're exempt from this 99-year grant of rights clause that Colorado had to sign if they didn't have an eye on what could be next and what move they might need to make that's in their own best interests. I absolutely agree. I think it was a great move by President Randall, Mark Harlan, to make sure that Utah didn't have to sign up for something that does in so many ways just you know, tie their future in. And grant of rights, there's things that can happen, of course. That, that's a really tough position for the Buffaloes to be in long term to me. And Utah, they don't have to be in that position because there is an opportunity to get out as we discussed too. And I totally agree with you when you talk about like, I don't see Utah in the SEC. Like it doesn't make any sense. It's Utah. It's just like all the other schools of the SEC. Like what the heck would a, a Utah randomly do popping up in that? And that's if obviously super conferences and all these other things would have to happen in order for us to get to that point. But like because of Oregon, Washington, the California schools that are all now in the Big Ten, Utah doesn't seem as crazy. Yes, it's not of the caliber of a lot of the, the other brands in the Big Ten, but I'll say this. They're on their way to building themselves into one. They won two of the last three Pac-12 titles and didn't even get a fair shake to go after it this past year because of the injuries. I'm not saying they for sure would have repeated, but they didn't even have a chance when their starting quarterback went down. So now you have an opportunity to go in the Big 12 and – you know, if they win it this year, that's great. And then even if they could win some post Cam Rising, like you're talking about a team that would have several conference championships by the time potentially by the time we do the next round of massive realignment. And I think that makes Utah attractive because you want teams in your conference because college football drives all of this. Of course, it's the reason this is locked on college football is because of the power that the sport of college football has. Utah's a powerhouse in college football. They've won conference championships. I know they've come short in a bowl game or two, but the ability to beat USC and Oregon on massive stages, that means something. And this is a Utah team that even when a cam rising to some of the veterans go away, who's been Utah's standout quarterback, I don't think this program is going anywhere. Even when Kyle Whittingham retires, I feel like they're set up to continue to have a similar transition to like what we've seen when Urban Meyer left and Ohio State hasn't missed a beat. I know not all Ohio State fans are happy with the position that the Buckeyes are in, but they have, they've they still been a top five program, basically. And I think that's what Utah will continue to be a top 15 program even after Kyle Whittingham departs. So I think they're definitely putting themselves in a very strong position depending on all, all the realignment craziness goes. If the Big Ten wants to add a really good football program, Utah will be one of the schools that can stand up and say, hey, look at our resume. I think we're pretty attractive for the opening that you guys might potentially have. And the other thing, too, is if Utah doesn't do that, I don't think they need to be making the move. I'm talking about them on today's show, or we are rather, because they could. Because if an opportunity presents itself to where you can strike while the iron's hot, I mean, if the Big Ten decides they want to add, you know, Florida State, Miami, and Clemson somehow, I mean, that, that's a pretty radical scenario. I don't know that that's close to happening necessarily, but if they were to get those three and they're like, oh, we're looking for a four, hey, Utah's over here then Utah would have an ability to say, okay, we are going to depart. Now, I have not read all the legalese about what it would take to leave the conference, but you know, the, the, the other side of this is that they're not a voting member of the Big 12 board, and so that's kind of the exchange that they've made. So that makes me think you know, that the Big 12 agreed to that, that even they understand Utah could maybe be a realignment target one day, but I think that Utah can be in a wait and see mode. They can they can stay in the Big 12 even if the Big 10 even, you know, adds a Florida State and Clemson for instance. I think Utah can stay in the Big 12, establish themselves as the best program there, make them the most attractive. One certainly on the academic side of things, I think they would be the best fit in the Big 10 from any team that is in the Big 12. I don't know that there's a close second in, on that particular side of things because remember, presidents vote on realignment, not athletic directors or football coaches. So I think the Utes are in a good spot, but this is something that, you know, I've seen pop up a couple times and made me think, man, they, they, they could be the next team. Like, obviously, Florida State is, is, is actively trying to get out of their conference, and that's different. But if Utah sees an opportunity, they have the ability to walk through that door. JT Wistersill, Locked on Utes. Check them out on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts as well. JT, good to have you on. Talking as always, Spencer. Billy Napier, a hot seat coach in spring football. What is that like? We'll check in in Gainesville next. First, today's episode of Locked On College Football is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. 
Whether it's opening weekend for baseball, which is right around the corner, or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On as well, and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences. Fire TV channels let you dive into the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, and more. Not to mention great news news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. Billy Napier's on the hot seat. Well, actually, that belief depends on who you ask. I'd see it that way. Not everybody does. Brandon Olson joining me at Locked On Gators doesn't automatically see it that way. But going into spring football, which is kicked off down in Gainesville, and we'll get to momentarily, what's the mood around Florida's head coach right now? A lot of questions. A lot a lot of questions. Because it's also, uh, no matter how you feel about it, it's never a good look to have Steve Spurrier, the head ball coach for Florida, you know, national championship winning coach. Um, he came out last week and he was just like, I don't know what the hell they're doing down there. So never a good look to have Steve Spurrier. Come out yeah, not great. Not that's great. not that's not ideal. But, you know, are, are fans divided on, on whether or not this should be a make or break year for Billy Napier? It's the hardest schedule in college football. It's I, I don't know anybody except for Georgia, maybe, maybe Texas, maybe Texas that could win 10 games with this schedule. I mean, it's it's absolutely brutal. I don't even know if Ohio State and Oregon could win 10 games on, on this particular schedule. So is that kind of softening the mood around Billy Napier and Florida fans just expecting, yeah, this is not going to be the season that we've all been waiting for? Uh, yes and no, because I do think that a lot of Florida Gators fans, myself included, we say, you know, greatness isn't the goal here. It's the expectation. Uh, So no matter who's on the schedule, you should be able to win 10 games. But I think if you want to be the realistic side also, like that's where I'm torn because the realistic side is looking at this roster, this coaching staff's capabilities to this point, this schedule, hard sell. Uh, I do think that he gets a little bit of leeway where if this was just an average schedule, we'd go, okay, you need to win eight games or you're fired. But here, I think a lot of us are kind of, if you don't make a bowl game, you need to go. And I, I think that's how... We have to kind of look at it. As Napier comes into spring football this year, Brandon, what should his biggest priorities be? How does he work on on the team needs or where do they need to improve the most in order to get themselves to a bowl game? I think for Billy Napier specifically, he needs to really focus on the offensive line because the way that they've kind of shifted responsibilities on the coaching staff, they hired Ron Roberts to be the head coach of the defense. So he's handling all of the day-to-day he's coaching the coaches that's going to be his responsibility to figure out what that defense is but for billy napier your offensive line was atrocious last year they had the second highest blown block rate in college football or in, in the fbs uh and you, you had a lot of shuffling pieces one of your guards went to florida state one of your guards went to nebraska uh one of your tackles is now playing guard you have a center returning, you have your left tackle returning, but you've got a lot of moving pieces here that you need to figure out on what was an atrocious offensive line last year. One of the reasons that they had to throw the ball so much was because they couldn't run the ball behind that offensive line. It it was just bad throughout. So for Billy Napier, he needs to focus on offensive line play because, I mean, especially now he hired Jonathan DeCoster from the Cleveland Browns, who I spoke to Jedrick Wills, positive things about him. Spoke to Jamal Pettigrew. He used to play for LSU under Jonathan DeCoster. Positive things, but hired a guy with one year of on-field coaching experience to be the an on-field coach at Florida. This isn't a job where you kind of get your big break. This is the job where you've been established and do that. Um, and, and Billy Napier continued that trend. But on the offensive side of the ball, you need to figure out the line. You have a lot of money invested there and no results from 2023. How much better do you think they can be? I mean, it sounds like they had one of the worst offensive lines in the SEC last year. Can they be in in the middle of the pack? I do think you can get to the middle of the pack. You brought in uh, Brandon Crenshaw Dixon, who from San Diego State, who's finally trying to make that step to power four football, and and I do think he can do that. I like this film a lot. 
looking at on the interior, you have a lot of young guys that can make that step. Damian George was your starting right tackle and is moving to guard. I think he's a better guard. I think a lot of people said that when he came over from Alabama, but injuries and everything forced him to play tackle still. Uh, so we'll see him play there, and I do think he'll play well. Jake Slaughter is one of the best returning centers in football. I think it's just about figuring out what's the best combination of five players that works out because you do have some pieces on that offensive line, including a, a all freshman player that you had in Najee Harris. So, so the pieces are there, but you have to figure out how to make them play as a unit. And this is a team where they like to say five equals one on the offensive line. And I mean, they did not play like one in 2023 at all. So I, I do think that you can be a lot better having that returning center production is definitely going to help. But yeah, I, I think that the ceiling is still limited. What about the guy who they're going to be protecting up front? Graham Mertz last year, I, I don't think he was necessarily the problem. I just don't know that he is the answer for Florida as they try to get back to their their once former glory under Steve Spurrier or Urban Meyer in those sorts of days. I think he's fine in the SEC, though, where you have a pretty good lineup of quarterbacks. I don't think he's all the way at the bottom, but he is definitely closer to that part of it than he is towards the top. What does Billy Napier and what do the Gators' entire coaching staff need to work on the most with him to get him better in spring football as they look ahead to the fall? I think one of the big things is getting rid of the ball quicker and taking deep shots. Those, those are probably the two biggest things that I would say because – he had a fantastic completion percentage, but one of the shortest average depth of targets in college football last year. He really just just checked down Charlie did the entire year. And yards after the catch are great. Um, but you need to make teams respect a deep ball. It'll open up your passing game underneath. It'll open up your run game. And getting rid of the ball, there were far too many times where Graham Mertz took a sack where, again, the offensive line, get it, they were bad, but you could throw the ball away. You can try to step up and scramble a little bit and try to just minimize your loss there. But far too many times, Graham Mertz would take a sack, and, and then you're in second and 17, third and 14, and it's really hard to convert those frequently. Uh, so I, I do think that that's mainly the big area that you got to step up with with Graham Mertz. I think having him back for year two in this offense get, does give you a massive boost to have a returning quarterback, returning starting quarterback, when you play a schedule where there's not a ton of that. So you have kind of that advantage, I would expect, and, and – History shows that when QBs get their year two in an offense, they tend to take a pretty big jump. So we're going to hope that he can do that. Again, I, I just need you to be above average, keep the offense on schedule, and don't don't shoot yourself in the foot. What about defensively? Uh, you know, when I first watched the Gators play last year, and Brandon is praying to the heavens for those of you listening on uh, on podcasts here. When I first saw Florida play last year, the first, the very first play was a backup quarterback in Bryson Barnes throwing a 70-yard touchdown. D defensively, is Florida going to be good enough? Well, I don't know if they'll be good enough, but I know you can't be worse than what we said. <laughs> that was just uh, uh, absolutely terrible. I that's what my family and I call aim low and achieve right there. That's, our, that's the title of our group text with the four of us, my brother and my parents. Aim low and achieve. Is that where Florida's defense is at? I think so. Uh, I do think that they'll be considerably improved uh, from what we saw last season. I think that you lost Prince Liam on me, Ellen, and obviously it's not great to lose a future NFL edge rusher. But I think that you improved your defensive line overall. I think you improved your linebacker room a lot. Significant upgrade there. Your safety room got better. The only area where I still have massive question marks is that corner. Um which is not a good place to have those question marks. But uh, I think that you've improved throughout your team. And when you look at the missed tackles, those should be cut down significantly. Generating a pass rush as a unit would be nice instead of just princely or blitz or nothing. Uh, so I do think that this defense will be better. I think that you can probably see them get into the 40 or 50 range, which isn't awesome, but it's considerably improved from where they were last year. And you look at if that defense plays just, average last year you make a bowl game you win some more games but they were just terrible and i think that this year they're going to be improved i think bringing in ron roberts helps a ton i know austin armstrong hasn't really worked out to this point but bringing in his mentor in ron roberts and a guy that i very much respect there i think he's going to make the defense take some pretty big strides 
Brandon Olson, Locked On Gators. Check him out on YouTube and wherever you're listening to your podcasts if you want daily Florida Gators content. Brandon, great to have you by, as always, talking some Gator spring football. Thanks, Spencer. Chip Kelly is getting absolutely flamed by the UCLA media. I don't think fans really like him either. I'm going to defend Chip Kelly. Before we get to Chip Kelly, today's episode of Locked On College Football is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free, which is like a really awesome price. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else, and LinkedIn does all that while making the price as easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. That's why two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. You can as well. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So Chip Kelly is getting absolutely dragged through the mud by UCLA media members, by fans, everywhere you look. It's negative about Chip Kelly and leaving UCLA. There's a piece in the LA Times about quiet quitting by the now Ohio State offensive coordinator. And I am not going to defend everything about Chip Kelly's UCLA's head coach. I am leaning far more than just 5149 in defending his tenure in Los Angeles. Here's why. The Bruins did not have a Chip Kelly problem. The Bruins had and still have an administration problem. They have a leadership problem. That's why their football program is not as successful as it's capable of being. It hasn't been in my entire lifetime. They're the number two program in their own city. USC has felt like they've run away from them at times. Chip Kelly went three and three against USC, but let's just put that aside. Okay, let's let's put that aside. So the narratives about Chip Kelly out there, I'll, I'll push back on the ones I don't agree with. I will grant, I'm going to yield some ground here to those who are likely to be in the comment section who are not going to agree with my particular take here. Chip Kelly leaving just before spring football puts your administration in a difficult situation. I am not going to argue that. Chip Kelly has never been and was not at UCLA a great recruiter. Not something that he is big on. He he wasn't at Oregon either and he wasn't big about, you know, things with alumni and donors and everything like that. But you know what? Okay, those are fair criticisms of Chip Kelly. Here's what's not fair about criticizing Chip Kelly. Looking at his tenure at UCLA and saying, this is a failure, this guy was a mess, it was a train wreck, it was awful, is just simply not true. It is not true. And I think UCLA fans are directing their anger, which they deserve to have, as someone you know, who, if you're a UCLA fan, is in a major city, and, and you've got the recruiting footprint that you have and the television market and the stadium that you play in is the home of college football, for goodness sake. Yeah, UCLA football should be better, but it never has been and it won't be until there's a cultural and administrative change. And that change is demonstrated or the, the need for change is demonstrated in their lack of commitment in several areas. So I don't think Chip Kelly was a great recruiter. He never was. I don't think he wanted to do anything except coach football. That's why he's now an offensive coordinator against, you know, against UCLA in the Big Ten. We said, nah, I'd I'd, I'd rather be an OC. Like part of that is certainly on Chip Kelly. But the administration at UCLA, to say that they are committed the way you need to be to be competitive at a high level in today's college football world is way off base. Because DeAnton Lynn was UCLA's defensive coordinator this past year. He was a stud. His side of the ball was actually better than Chip Kelly's, which is something that I thought would happen because they had a reset at the quarterback position. It was between Ethan Garbers, Colin Schley, and the five-star Dante Moore, who's now at Oregon. All those guys weren't able to separate themselves. So it was kind of this weird smorgasbord mix and should it be this guy or that guy or what should happen here or there. It was a it was a bounce back year or, or a reset year of sorts. That's what my expectations were for UCLA. I predicted their record right on the money at seven and five. Their defense was very very good. Not only did UCLA 
allow D'Anton Lin to leave the program, he went to their crosstown rival. Okay, when you look at programs that are committed to winning at a high level, they don't let those things happen. Lateral moves should not be ones, especially to USC, that an administration that cares deeply about winning on the football field allows to happen. Perfect example. The Washington Huskies offensive coordinator from this past year, who's now my Seahawks offensive coordinator in the NFL, Ryan Grubb, he was courted by Alabama. The Crimson Tide wanted to hire him as their offensive coordinator. And the Huskies said, we will give you $2 million if you, and you'll be the highest paid coordinator in this entire conference if you just stay and we go make a run at a national championship. And guess what? They made it all the way to the national championship game. That's what an all-in investment looks like. You don't let your great coaches walk to USC. That, that's not what happens here. So then the other narrative about Chip Kelly is he didn't recruit. Okay, he took over a situation at UCLA that wasn't great, hasn't been a great job, certainly not a bad job. I think if you put the right coach in place at UCLA, I don't know if Deshaun Foster's that guy, but if you were to put him in place there, then you would certainly have a better situation than than they have had. Although let's let's not pretend like everything was a complete and total mess. But here are Chip Kelly's recruiting classes. He was hired in 2018. Now, admittedly, I don't know how influential he was in that 2018 class. I don't remember all the details and the timeline and everything of that sort. But that was their highest ranked recruiting class during his tutelage. It was 19th. In 2019, it was 44th. Then it went up to 31st. Then it was 25th then it was 29th, then it was 25th, and now the 24 class, of course, because Chip Kelly didn't want to be there anymore, is all the way down to 59th. So in his six seasons, that's one, two, three, oh yeah, four classes that are inside the top 30. Now, is that where UCLA recruiting is capable of being? No, I don't believe so. But to say that Chip Kelly did something different at UCLA than what he would have done anywhere else is not accurate. He is not known to be a great recruiter. The administration had to have known that when they hired him. And did he have enough talent to win more games than he did? Yep, a lot of coaches do. Saying, well, he he fell short of expectations. You know how many coaches fall short of expectations but are still succeeding? Heck, Dan Lanning at Oregon fell short of expectations last year. They should have beaten Washington at least once, if not twice. And guess what? He went 0 for 2. And in his first year, should you should always beat Oregon State. He didn't do that. Coming short in an individual season is not reflective of an overall indictment of a coach to say, well, you know, he didn't come, he came up short this year. Steve Sarkeesian went five and seven at Texas. Texas is a much bigger football school than UCLA. It's not close. He had a five and seven year. And then this past season, of course, he was in the college football playoff. They quote unquote fell short of expectations there. Should Steve Sarkeesian just be viewed as a bum head coach? No, I don't think so. Now in the modern era of college football, I'm saying since 2010, that's when a lot of things started to change with media rights and facilities and all this sort of stuff. And the sport, you know, started taking off in a, in a big, big way. Since 2010, The best run of UCLA football was under Jim Mora in the early years in which he was UCLA's head coach. He had a nine-win season, a 10-win season, a 10-win season, and an eight-win season. That That is the best that UCLA football has consistently been in my lifetime. Chip Kelly's record since COVID, after he came in, inherited a rough situation, did not turn it around quickly. Again, I'll grant you that, and recruiting can be a part of that. I'm not going to argue that point with you UCLA fans. The last three years, he went eight and four, nine and four, eight and five. Are we going to sit here and pretend like that is some abject disaster, that they're just a calamity? Yeah, they had some bad losses. Yeah, they fell short of their full potential, particularly in 2022. That team with Dorian Thompson Robinson was really good. They could have won the Pac-12. They didn't. Guess what? That's college football. Ohio State didn't win the Big Ten this past year. Does that mean they weren't good enough? Does that mean Ryan Day stinks? No. But UCLA fans, I think, have a tendency to get caught up. And, well, you know, this didn't happen and that didn't happen. Okay, but what is happening? Because I see UCLA relevant. I see UCLA winning games. I see UCLA in top 25 polls. I saw them get all the way inside the top 10 in 2022. 
So don't tell me that Chip Kelly has completely forgotten how to coach or that he's absolutely terrible. He did nothing right. It was absolutely, it was all bad or anything like that. Did he recruit as well as Jim Mora? No. Mora has showcased what the recruiting standard can be and what they hope Deshaun Foster can be. And I'm going to get back to the administration when it comes to him in just a moment. Jim Mora's recruiting classes in that four-year stretch went like this, 18th, 7th, 18th, and 12th. So consistently, what we have seen is that UCLA can be a top 20 recruiting team every year. Under Chip Kelly, they were consistently in the top 30. Is that a calamitous drop-off? No, it's a drop-off. It's it's certainly a drop-off, but it is not cratering all the way out. In 2024, 59th in the country. Yeah, and by the way, this is not factoring in the transfer portal, which is been very, very good uh, to the, or sorry, these classes do factor in the transfer portal, which was very, very good to the Bruins and is a perfectly valid way to, you know, build a quality, competent roster. And UCLA brought in a lot of great transfers over the last couple of years. So that brings us to Deshaun Foster. And even the UCLA administration was kind of taking shots at Chip Kelly. When he was introduced in that video where all the players are going crazy and they, they're so excited that Deshaun Foster, the running backs coach who hasn't been a head coach or even a coordinator before, has, is taking over as, as their head coach. You, you know, you know what, what I felt when Deshaun Foster was hired? That was the cheap option. That, that's, that's not an all-in sort of investment. The timing is difficult. I understand that. The coaching carousel had shifted around. Jeff Halfley left Boston College. They left, he left Boston College, and they were able to get a more qualified candidate for the job than Deshaun Foster. But, you know, the, the guy who introduced Deshaun Foster to the team, he said, we want someone who wants to be a Bruin. Well, we got someone who is a Bruin. That's great. And I'm sure that feels really, really good. But is that the best coaching candidate available? We've seen coaches leave late in the cycle. And this is back to the administrative buy-in. I don't see it from the top down. I do not see a university that has a burning desire and is willing to pay what has to be paid to be competitive nationally in college football. I don't see it taking place. Can Deshaun Foster recruit better than Chip Kelly did? He certainly could. Could he do better with NIL? Yep, absolutely. Could he have a better relationship with fans and alumni? Yep, he could do all of those things. But don't the results on the field matter most at the end of the day? You're telling me the best guy you could get for a job that you feel Chip Kelly wildly underperformed at. You, 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 you're telling me the, the best guy available? You tell me there were no power four coordinators anywhere in college football that wanted to come be UCLA's head coach. That's not a good sign. That is an indictment of what UCLA's administration has done. And until that mindset changes, UCLA fans can blame Chip Kelly all they want. It's not going to get better as they go into the Big Ten until that aspect of the program changes course. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a great weekend and a wonderful rest of your day.